So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Elvis Pancel, president of Estonia Europe. Welcome to this uh, webinar, uh, talking a bit about uh, DBS. Um, I know we have uh, some, maybe some Canadian attendees. You are very welcome. Thanks for this. Um, so uh, you will be able during the webinar to, to uh, ask questions. Uh, you should have a button uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, Q&A to, to ask you questions. We will try to, uh, to address them all, otherwise uh, uh, we will uh, edit them after the, the webinar. Uh, I'm sorry to inform you that uh, Jan, our patient, is unfortunately sick. So we will try to um, uh, share a video of him with uh, his testimony. Sorry for that. And I'm very happy um, to have you all for this webinar. We'll, we'll be saved and available afterwards on uh, Distonia Europe Media. So we are, I took a cold, so my voice is uh, on top of that. Uh, so I will let uh, Rachel introduce uh, the webinar and our speakers. Thanks a lot, Rachel, to moderate uh, this webinar for us. Hi, thank you, Edwish, and it's my pleasure to moderate this for you. Um, my name is Rachel Jones. I'm your facilitator today. I have actually worked previously. I probably know some of you. I've worked previously with Estonia Europe as your facilitator in many of your live meetings as well. Um, today, we're going to cover in the next hour, um, we're going to go through the um, physician's point of view of DBS, deep brain stimulation for patients. And I'll introduce your, our eminent speaker shortly. Um, and after we've talked about the medical uh, side of deep brain stimulation, we're then going to move to a colleague who works in um, the industry, works actually for Medtronics and works in the technology industry to talk about the more practical um, use of deep brain stimulation from a scientific point of view. And as we, Edwige, as you said, sadly, um, Jan Bodenbach can't be with us today as he's he's unwell. So we are going to have the patient point of view, and I hope I'm going to be able to share my screen with you and actually share that video. Otherwise, Edwige, maybe I'll ask ask you to do that for me, but I'll have a go for us anyway with that okay. video. Um, and just to echo, Edwige, what you've said, uh, that we will take questions. It is quite a tight agenda. So if we can take the questions at the end of all our speakers and at the end of the video, and just to reiterate, there's a Q&A button if you look down on the bottom of your screens, if you can pop your questions into there and we'll take them at the end, right at the end of all three presentations. And any that aren't answered, Edwige and I will work together with Dystonia Europe to come back to you with those. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Laura Seif. Laura is based at the Department of Neurosurgery in Montpellier in France. Um, she has an eminent bio. Um, you are a, a consultant with a focus on the treatment of movement disorders, but also I know that you have a PhD, an MD and a master's and you supervise master's um, students as well and master's submissions. And you are um, an editor. Um, associate editor on the editorial board of movement disorders and frontiers in neurology and actually you're a reviewer on numerous um, neurological journals one I noticed was brain and the European Journal of Neurology so eminent speaker really lucky to have you here today to look at us to introduce to us the um, DBS um, and how it's how it's actually deployed to patients so I'll hand it over to you Laura. Thank you very much for this introduction. I would just make it sure that my screen is shared now. It's it's all right. Yeah, so, we can see it. Thanks. Uh, so thank you very much for this kind invitation to Europe uh, to Estonia Europe. So the question I would have to answer over this webinar is DBS benefits for Estonia patients. Who is it for? So before speaking specifically which patients with dystonia will benefit, a few words about this treatment. So it is a neurosurgical intervention, which will allow implantation of electrodes within the brain. You can see in this uh, figure, the placement of electrodes within the basal ganglia, which are relied with uh, uh, via extension cables to the neurostimulator, which can, which can be in different positions in the subclavicular area or in this X-ray uh, in the abdominal area in order to del deliver chronic stimulation 
And the role of this uh, deep brain stimulation system is to stimulate specific brain targets. So one can note that deep brain stimulation comes for other surgical neurosurgical interventions, lesional neurosurgery, uh, which was addressed to the same targets. Uh, deep brain stimulation compared to lesional surgery is minimally invasive. Uh, it's related to low incidence of severe adverse effects. More frequently, we can see complications as, for example, infections or me mechanical complications related to the system. And deep brain stimulation will have a, a direct physiologic effect on brain circuits at different levels, cellular level, molecular level, and will induce plastic changes within the network. Some objective advantages uh, have to be highlighted in clinical use of DBS versus therapeutic lesional surgery. First of all, the fact that it, DBS electrodes can be implanted bilaterally, so treat bilateral symptoms, and also adjustability. Some of DBS settings, like for example, intensity, frequency, the place where we stimulate on the uh, DBS electrode can be adjusted specifically for a given patient. So deep brain stimulation in dystonia will relate and will be addressed to the motor circuit and specifically the leads will be implanted in different nuclei within the, deep, within the basal ganglia. The most important target is the globus pallidus pars interna, but other uh, structures as for example, the subthalamic nucleus, which is the most frequently used target in Parkinson's disease, and also some structures, motor nuclei of the thalamus can be proposed and tested as alternative targets for the brain stimulation in dystonia. Before coming and discussing specifically the effects of deep brain stimulation in different forms of dystonia, one should maybe better uh, express, define what is dystonia. Of course, nobody knows better than yourself what is your dystonia. Nevertheless, uh, clinicians uh, are in front of very large and very distinct spectrum of conditions and symptoms, which all finally will correspond to a movement disorder, which is characterized by sustained or intermittent muscle contractions, which cause abnormal postures or movements or both. Frequently dystonia is activated worsened by action. And in many patients, dystonia can be associated to tremor. In this figure, you can see different forms of dystonia here, task specific focal dystonia, here, a, a cervical dystonia or a more severe generalized form of dystonia. And all these situations can uh, be addressed by DBS. I mentioned previously lesional surgeries and one why we come back uh, to, do, to these lesions. This is because uh, uh, years ago, uh, when lesional surgery was addressed to, to the globus pallidus pars interna, it was seen that in Parkinson's disease patients, not only Parkinsonian symptoms have been treated with these lesions within the globus pallidus pars interna, but also dystonic features and involuntary movements that are called dyskinesia. So here started the experience with deep brain stimulation in dystonic patients. The first papers, the first uh, reports related to two distinct conditions. The first one uh, published by Professor Kub and his team in Montpellier in 1999 related to a very severe generalized dystonic condition in a child with a, a very severe life-threatening status dystonicus. And what it was observed was that the benefit was significant However, already in this very first publication, it was described that recovery was very progressive and no immediate effect on dystonic symptoms was seen. This is also, this is illustrated beautifully by, by this figure, by Tisch, who, this, who showed that finally the motor improvement is very progressive over weeks or even months in dystonic patients. In this very second uh, publication, a very distinct clinical presentation was addressed by DBS, also to the globus pallidus, 
In this pu publication in 1999, Professor Krauss and his group published, reported in three patients who three patients who presented with very severe complex forms of focal dystonia in this in this case cervical dystonia and what he what he saw is not only that uh, the dystonic features improved but specifically pain related to dystonia and also disability uh, improved together with the motor improvement so these were the two first cases the two first publications which already illustrated that DBS can be discussed in very different forms of dystonia. A lot of effort was put over the last uh, decades to better classify dystonia in order to define homogeneous groups where uh, treatments, medical interventions, or surgical interventions can be addressed. Dystonia classification is, uh, um, is addressed following two axes. The first axis, the clinical condition, the symptoms related to age of onset body distribution and associated features. And the second axis will address the cause of dystonia, the etiology. And this is really important when we are discussing about the brain stimulation. How the brain stimulation indications progressed over time? based first on clinical phenomenology. It was addressed to patients who had symptoms refractory to medication and botulinum toxin injections with secondary acquired dystonias and better outcomes obtained in some forms of the movement disorders and especially in mobile forms of dystonia. Following these initial experiences which were presented previously, in 2000, uh, again, the group of uh, Professor Poup in Montpellier published in a homogeneous, larger group of patients with uh, childhood onset dystonia in whom a very significant clinical improvement has identified. And it turned that this population was presenting with a genetic disorder, the first genetically uh, proven uh, form of dystonia. This is why it was called DYT1, DYT as dystonia, and 1 as the first, first genetic form which was recognized and described. Given the very good results in this group, it, came, it became a reference population when discussing indications for other cases or other forms of dystonia. Later on, uh, also in an isolated group of generalized dystonia, a multicentric uh, French study uh, uh, driven by Professor Vidaille in Paris documented a very good also clinical improvement in adult patients with generalized dystonia in whom the mean improvement was a 51% with in some patients superior uh, result to this number, but in otherwise more limited clinical benefit. And it was already discussed in this publication that the variability could be related to genetic heterogeneity or to the characteristics of the movement disorder. Phasic movements responding better than more fixed or tonic uh, dystonic postures. In more uh, further, uh, this experience in adult populations, in, in a prospective longer follow-up study by the German group led uh, by Professor Volkmann, it has been demonstrated that both in generalized and also in segmental isolated dystonia, the benefit obtained at steady state will maintain over time. And interestingly, in this population, it was highlighted in this column with the black squares that some patients were not responders despite a well-positioned electrode in both groups, generalized and segmental dystonias. So uh, finally, even in the group of isolated dystonia populations, for some reasons, there, are, there is a heterogeneity of the clinical response. Further, in more limited, more extended uh, forms of dystonia, namely 
in cervical dystonia, refractory to medication and botulinum toxin injections, it was demonstrated that a, a, a real significant clinical benefit was obtained in a study reporting 62 patients and comparing a group where the stimulation was uh, initiated from the beginning and we see a drop of the uh, uh, motor score severity compared to a second group where for three months stimulation was not delivered and starting the stimulation at three months, we saw an impro a clinical improvement of the motor scores. Further, uh, these isolated forms of dystonia in the, in the uh, uh, Independently on the distribution from focal to generalized, we saw that a significant clinical benefit could be obtained. This is the reason why for other groups of dystonia in acquired forms, the same question was asked. Is the brain stimulation efficient also in acquired forms of dystonia? And very beautifully, uh, the question was answered in a multicentric study led by Professor Vidaille in France, where the change in the movement uh, subscale score was tested in a population of adult cerebral palsy. And what was observed in this study was that the overall improvement was more limited than in the patients with isolated dystonia with 24.4% of improvement versus you remember 50% in the, in the isolated generalized dystonia group in adults. But in this publication, it was also documented that again, body pain was also improved as in cervical dystonia. The, the same result was, con, uh, was uh, confirmed in a meta-analysis which was led by Anne Koy from Germany, who in 68 patients collected over 20 publications in, pa uh, in patients with cerebral palsy, reported a very significant and very, sorry, very similar clinical improvement of 23.6 uh, points on, uh, on the motor section of the Berg scale, which is a dystonia scale. Another group of patients from, from the acquired dystonia group is the tardive dystonia. These are patients who received neuroleptic treatments over their lifetime and developed dystonic features. A very significant and early clinical benefit following pallidal brain stimulation is obtained in this group. Uh, or already within the first weeks, a significant clinical uh, benefit is uh, seen and measured, which is maintained over long-term follow-up. So when we want to summarize these this few examples where deep brain stimulation is in indications for dystonia, we conclude that results are heterogeneous with very good improvements in these two cases of isolated dystonia and more limited benefit in the population of acquired dystonia, as for example, cerebral palsy patients. So multiple factors uh, may interfere in any patient in order to affect and contribute to the deep brain stimulation outcome variability. These factors may relate to the dystonia in itself, to the disease, the diagnosis, the disease duration, genetic cause, the time of follow-up. Sometimes some patients need to necessitate longer follow-up in order to have the best benefit. This was discussed, for example, for acquired dystonias, but also factors related to DBS itself, the choice of the target, the simulation parameters as well. So given the fact that many progresses were seen and obtained in, in the field of genetics with many diagnoses of genetic forms of dystonia over the last decade, one legitimate key question to be answered is whether genetic testing is useful when we are discussing DBS for dystonia. Available evidence 
indicates that genetic factors play an important role in outcomes, not only in those isolated forms of dystonia, which, which are of genetic uh, origin, but also in more complex phenotypes, as for example, uh, as related to one gene, which is called the gna one gene, which uh, is responsible of very severe, usually, forms of disease where severe dystonic crisis and epilepsy are associated and repetitive information over publications documented a very positive effect in suppressing this life-threatening uh, dystonic crisis. In other populations, as for example in the kmt 2 b related disorder, also significant clinical benefit can be, uh, can be obtained with brain stimulation. I highlighted these disorders because it seems to be to become one of the most frequently uh, frequent cause of childhood onset uh, dystonia. In order to highlight the role of genetics uh, when we are discussing about the brain stimulation efficacy, in these two articles, what is addressed is the difference in the outcome according to the genetic uh, uh, disorder, to the gene which is mutated in the different forms of dystonia. The DYT1, uh, disease is the reference, as, as you can see in some forms of genetic dystonia, some better improvement is expected or reported in others. Meanwhile, in others, a significantly less satisfactory benefit is maintained uh, in these different groups of genetic diseases. It's not a matter of how we call the genes, but to just to highlight that there is a variability according to the genetic cause and genetics has a meaningful role uh, when we are discussing about the effects of DBS and prognosis with this treatment. So as almost a summary, dystonia is heterogeneous and deep brain stimulation outcomes are variable. Effective DBS requires, of course, well-placed electrodes and optimized stimulation. Non-responders, as, as you can hear previously, may occur even in properly selected and treated patients. Technological developments may assist to better selection of candidates and improve or adapt DBS delivery. In this uh, figure, a timeline of the yearly growth of number of, of publications uh, related to DBS um, are documented. And one should remember that FDA approval for DBS uh, for treating dystonia was, uh, was in 2003. And later, uh, technological developments occurred in 2015, the occurrence or the availability of directional leads, which allows to stimulate and to modify the, the electric field uh, in order to maybe improve therapeutic benefit and limitate side effects. And also in 2020, FDA approved sensing uh, uh, with a new system developed in order to allow, to give the possibility to record from the stimulated structures chronically under continuous therapeutic stimulation. So which are the indications of the brain stimulation in, in dystonia? A take-home message, good candidates, isolated generalized segmental and cervical dystonia tardy dystonia, some forms, of, some forms of genetic dystonias, without forgetting the dystonic crisis, and more poorer outcomes, difficult to predict in acquired and degenerative forms, and also in fixed dystonias. So deep brain stimulation benefits for dystonia patients, who is it for? In fact, importantly, the answer to the question should come from clinician and and together from the patient, from the patient and caregiver, the clinician will support with all the available evidence for a given indication. The objectives may be very different according to the dystonia side and extent, the age of indication, and disability related to dystonia. Finally, the brain stimulation may provide may be provided properly only in the frame of a multidisciplinary setup. 
With this, I finish my presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention. And we will take the questions at the end of, of, the, of the other presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sif, that was brilliant. And we do have questions already coming in, but as you said, we'll actually take those um, at the end of the presentations. That was brilliant, thank you. So we have a number of questions relating to some of your, some of your presentation in relating to treatment and suitability. Um, and we're now going to move on to um, Thomas Brion. So Thomas, um, Thomas is a Med Medtronic employee um, and he works in the brain modulation division uh, based in Switzerland. So he uh, wanted us to point out he's not a medical doctor, but he is a neuroscientist trained in Paris, France and San Francisco um, and is now back in Switzerland, I understand, um, and where he later specialised as a research scientist in deep brain stimulation. So Thomas is going to take us through the technical aspects of that from a um, neuroscientist point of view. So over to you, Thomas. And again, we'll take questions right at the very end of the presentations. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to Distonia Rob for the invitation. I'm gonna go in full screen mode, which should be okay now. Um, so this is really a, a focus on brain sensing. So the latest technologies uh, that I'm gonna share today are relating to these technologies that relate to sensing from the brain. And uh, as mentioned, if you have any medical questions, I recommend you talk to your uh, medical professional. I'm just gonna show you a bit of the, of the technology we're focusing on right now at Medtronic. The, the reason we're focusing on brain sensing so much is really coming from other medical device advances in the past that already exist. In diabetes, we now have sensors that are able to sense the level of glucose in the blood of a person, and then you can decide how much insulin gets delivered. In uh, heart rhythm management, you can also listen in a way to the rhythm of the brain and decide whether the brain needs stimulation and when and how much. Now, uh, whether, the, whether the heart needs stimulation and how much. Now, for the brain itself, it's much more complex. So it took many more decades before we could listen to the brain and see whether there was useful information that we could use uh, to help with the brain stimulation. And you heard from Dr. Seif uh, already about DBS in general, and I'm going to focus on how we can use the exact same system of DBS that delivers the stimulation to listen uh, to the brain and listen to what type of signals are we talking about? So you may know about electroencephalograms, the, the big, you know, when your entire head is covered in, uh, in recording uh, devices. Well, that's not the goal here. We're not gonna record at the skin level. Uh, we're not gonna record at the level of the surface of the brain. We're gonna use the fact that because there is an electrode used to treat the symptoms of dystonia, we're gonna use the exact same electrode to record brain signals. So they will not be from everywhere. They will only be limited to the area where the electrode is located. So it's a few thousand neurons that we're gonna listen to, not an individual one, a small population of neurons, but we're hoping that these are the neurons that are related to movement. So they're the, the important ones in a way, the ones that are being treated that we're gonna record from. Now, how neurons speak? Well, there's multiple ways to describe it. There's electricity, there's chemistry, and in local field potentials, we think of frequencies. So if you think of sound, a high frequency sound is a high pitch sound. And if you, if, uh, if you think of a low frequency sound, it's like a bass, it's a low, it's a low frequency sound. And neurons are a bit like that. So depending on if you look at the low frequencies to the left or the high frequencies to the right, uh, scientists, and let's face it, mostly working in Parkinson's disease, there's so much more knowledge around that recording uh, of the brain related to Parkinson's disease have identified various frequency bands. So uh, a few hertz wide, a few dozen hertz wide that associate with certain uh, symptoms or certain normal brain functions. So when a brain is alive, the neurons are firing, they're having a rhythm and certain rhythm are completely normal brain function and certain rhythms may be associated with symptoms that are preventing proper movement, for example. And the devices that we really focused on are really looking at, at you know, frequencies that are between zero and a hundred hertz, because these are the things that are in a way easier for us to record in a small, in a small package and you'll see what it looks like. Now, in the case of Parkinson's disease, it's a, it's a disease that fluctuates a lot. It fluctuates throughout the day. And as people with Parkinson's disease take medications, the effect of their medications fluctuate a lot. But DBS remains extremely stable, extremely flat. So the hope for us by listening to the brain is that we can track all these changes of the effect either of medication or just the changes of the effect of the disease 
in the brain recorded from the same device with the hope of in the future using those to inform how we deliver uh, the stimulation. So Percept PC is the first device that we have that can do this for the Stonia, and I'm going to show you a bit how uh, we went there and how we arrived there. In the case of the Stonia, like I said, a lot of the research having been done in, uh, in Parkinson's disease, we have much fewer publications. We have less knowledge. So we know uh, that in the frequency bands that the, de the device is capable of recording, uh, the 4 to 12 hertz band is more associated with the phasic symptoms. So like the jerks, the movements that are really mobile. Um, and there are other frequency bands that could be uh, related to other types of symptoms. So we don't yet exactly have this number for this symptom because it's going to be probably symptom specific but also patient specific and that's the goal here is to have the frequency that is relevant for each person implanted with each device and that's really the goal of the ongoing research and I'll show you some example uh, at the very end how we did that in the past was really cumbersome because you had to have the electrodes literally coming out of the head so the electrode was deep inside the brain and then the recording was on the other side of the cable connected to a computer and as you can imagine, that's not very convenient to move around. So we developed a device uh, called Activa PC Plus S, which was more of a research style device uh, that could record some of those signals. So it could not record as well as an entire laboratory because it's all contained within the stimulator, uh, but it could record something. And we learned a lot from the research. So now the latest device, the one that is now accessible is called Percept PC. And that's the one that can record from zero to hundred Hertz in the brain based on specific settings, which I'm going to show you uh, in a bit. So the four main uh, features basically that you can use to record from the brain. If you agree and if your doctor agrees, then you can have these things set up and to try and look at those signals. So the first one is called brain sense survey. Then there is brain sense timeline, there's brain sense events, and the last one is brain sense streaming. So the brain sense survey is a very basic, it's basically a scan of all the contacts. So the doctor uses their tablet that talks to the device that's implanted in the body of the patient and scans all the electrode contacts to see are there signals that are usable? Is it not just electrical noise? Is this really meaningful? And what is the frequency? How is the brain tuned? Uh, is this in that 4 to 12 hertz band? Is this somewhere else? And in which context? Not all four contacts may have useful signals, some may have noise. So this really takes a few minutes. It's completely automated and it can be done by the doctor uh, in the office. So it's like, a, in a way, it's a sanity check of do we have signals are they for this particular patient and for this particular side of the brain? So this is an example from, from Parkinson's. The demonstrations images are from Parkinson's disease. It's the same principle in Estonia, but with a bit different frequency bands. So each side of the brain gets measured, and we're trying to identify which uh, frequency bands could be interesting, could be relevant uh, for the patient. Now, what's important also is that for people that have leads that are directional, like Dr. Steve presented, there are uh, segmented leads that can shape the stimulation in specific directions. We can also sense from those segments. So when you're doing a check, uh, it could potentially be useful to know are there specific segments that have more signal than others. Uh, so that could potentially help in the future informing the, the stimulation. And again, all of that is done automatically, whether you have directional leads or not. Now, the question is after the visit, what does the device do? So if the doctor and the patient think could be useful, they can turn on the brain sense timeline. So once they've identified a frequency that is of interest, there's a little band of five hertz that can be tracked throughout the day, 24 hours for up to two months. And then after two months, the memory is full, so it needs to be downloaded during a visit. And so that particular frequency band of interest is recorded all the time. So when a person sleeps, when they're doing sports, whenever that frequency of interest is tracked up and down. So again, this is an example for Parkinson's. So you can really see it goes up and down as the symptoms go up and down during the day. For dystonia, it could be a bit different, uh, but it's the same principle. So you pick a frequency and then you track it, one on the left, one on the right, and up to two months. And at the end of these two months, the data can be downloaded and looked at at the doctor uh, office. So it's only recorded from the selected contacts, from the selected targets. Uh, so it's not mind reading, it's really neuronal activity in a, a basal ganglia network that looks at the, at the motor outcomes. Uh, and then the event. So this is, in a way, it's automatic. The device does it. Once it's been turned on, it does it. Now, uh, the patient can participate in the recordings because instead of recording only one band all the time, the patient can trigger events. 
So by discussing with your doctor, you can decide to have uh, specific events that are important for you. So in the case of Parkinson's patients, sometimes they feel on, like the drugs are working, they feel off, the drugs are not working. They could have dyskinesia, so uncontrollable movements, or they could just have taken their medication and they can press on their patient programmer to trigger a 30 second recording of the entire available spectrum. So instead of having one frequency band, uh, you would have uh, the whole frequency uh, capability, but only for 30 seconds, because that's recording a lot of data. So you, you cannot do this all the time. You trigger it when it is uh, relevant, when the specific events has happened. And then afterwards, the doctor can look at these events and say, oh yeah, when you were feeling bad, your brain was acting in this particular way. So that could potentially be useful to inform specific things that may not happen during the visit, but that may happen at home and that could be that could be relevant. And then finally, the most, if you want, live interventional one uh, is called streaming. And this is only done in the office during a visit. And this is, again, a Parkinson-style uh, animation where you can track a frequency band. In this example, is the, the beta power. Uh, and you see the moving uh, curve at the top is how the brain power uh, changes over time, the energy, if you want, in the brain. And then at the bottom, there's a stimulation. And so the doctor can increase the stimulation and see whether it has an effect live streaming, really sending the information directly from the device to the tablet in real time. Now, we know in Parkinson's, the effects can be very quick, but as Dr. Sif said, uh, in this tunnel, they can be very slow. So we don't know yet whether this feature will be very useful uh, for people with dystonia in the office, just because of the time it takes to see uh, a potential effect. So we have to be careful about what the, the benefit could be uh, for this particular feature. Now, all of this, I mentioned a lot Parkinson's, does the device work for this, for recording signals in dystonia patients? And the answer is yes, but it's early research. So this is a, a paper from a, a group of, um, uh, it's actually a collaboration of, of multiple groups around Europe. And the first author was uh, Johan Tenezi. And out of those uh, 20 patients, there were five dystonia patients that were implanted in the globus pallidus internus and all uh, of their nuclei, so one on each side had usable signals. So in the theta alpha peak, and you see the average frequency was 5.7 Hertz. So we said before four to 12, so 5.7 were roughly in the middle. And what you can see on the graph, there's uh, in the Y axis, there's the, the frequency. And on the, then the, the dots are individual uh, hemispheres. So the, every patient and every side of the brain could have a different frequency. So it's very personalized in that sense. Also, uh, about 27% of the contact pairs had an artifact. So in a way, that's noise. And that's much more than we used to seeing. Uh, and it could potentially be related to movements. Uh, as the recordings are very sensitive, if the patient moves a lot during the recording, there could potentially be noise that makes the recordings less interesting. So we have a hope that this could be useful, especially because DBS in dystonia is slow to affect. We're hoping that it could be useful to add an additional measurements not only just seeing the patient in the office, but also seeing what the brain does over days and weeks and months. Uh, we just have to be careful in terms of how much of this will be usable, how many contacts uh, will have useful signals. So as you can see, this is a small number of patients, uh, five, but we're starting to get uh, the first dystonia brain recordings from uh, these devices that are fully implanted. So. There's hope, it's ongoing research, uh, and we will be keep collecting data uh, and sharing with the other scientists and other doctors to understand better which are the useful frequency bands and how can we best modify them uh, with deep brain stimulation, with medication, or with any type of therapy that could be potentially beneficial for the patient by do using these brain readings as a sort of a, of a biomarker to understand better the, the disease. So if you have questions, the best obviously is talk to your doctor. And if you already have a device and you have questions about your, your technicalities of the device, depending on the country, some of the countries have an actual helpline with people that are trained to answer questions about the device. Others, I just put in uh, the office number. So here you may end up uh, having uh, just a, a Medtronic employee rather than a DBS specialist on the phone. So really um, talk to your doctor about these options and about these features to learn how to use the features, what they mean. And then if you have uh, tech support, don't hesitate uh, to call tech support questions uh, so that we can help um, if there's any opportunity. And thanks a lot for uh, your attention. And I'll gladly answer questions at the end. Uh, back to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That was brilliant. That was really informative. Um, and again, we'll take questions right at the very end. Um, we
We're going to have and be joined by um, Jan Bodenbach. Jan Bodenbach is a, a patient who lives with dystonia and lives with um, deep brain stimulation. And to your point as well, Thomas, actually, um, Jan's here. I can see his bio. I was really looking forward to meeting him because he is a world record holder. So he is the only person I've ever met who holds a world record. And his is, he was the first person to complete a 100 kilometer bike race with deep brain stimulation to actually hold that thought. It was one of my questions for you at the end, Thomas, about, you know, what can people carry on with with DBS in terms of their normal day-to-day -day living with that technology implanted into them. Um, and talking of technology, because unfortunately Jan, um, who cannot be with us today, um, as I understand he's poorly, he has sent us a video through. Now I'm going to attempt to share my screen and play said video. If I'm unable to, the video is actually a minute long, so we will distribute it to people um, at the end of the session if, for example, my technology fails when I try to do this. Um, and then we'll go straight to questions. So we are, you know, running, running close to time. So we'll then go straight to questions, but I will attempt to actually share my screen with people and see if we can actually play this video. And so this is on behalf of Jan, just bear with me. Okay. As long as I can only reach one person by telling my story, I've done everything right. I'm the first to compete in a 100 kilometer amateur bike race with a deep brain simulator. I got the generalized dystonia, which is a neurological brain failure. It was completely out of the game to go bike racing. I spent every three minutes almost every day on the bike in order to get in the right shape for the Hamburg Sir Classics. The support of my family and friends was the most important to come back to a normal life. Yeah, everybody said to me, you never will come out of the wheelchair again. With every kilometer on the bike, it was clearer that I'm going to make it. Being part of the Alperson family gave me the confidence to do the world record attempt. And I have now stopped sharing. Um, I, I Inspirational, I think really inspirational. Um, you know, amazing what people can do and amazing how people cope with adversity. And what we're going to do now is um, we have just over 10 minutes, which is perfect timing, actually, to take questions from our panellists. So let me go to the first one for Dr. Sif, which is... Um, how long does DBS tend to last and does that matter? I guess that's to the panel. Does it matter um, where the electrodes are placed, um, STN or GPI? So to um, Dr. Sif, how long does it tend to last? So uh, thank you for the question. There are in fact two questions in one. Uh, coming to the first question, how long DBS effect lasts? Uh, the, the first patient, uh, as, as far as we know, was operated in 1996, uh, so uh, more, than, uh, more than 20 years. So with, with this lens of follow-up, the patient still benefit from the treatment. So we know that more than 20 years, uh, DBS effect can last further, potentially yes, of course, but we need, we do not have longer follow up. So we do not expect normally to have, um, uh, let's say, a stop, a stopping of DBS effect in patients with dystonia. It can happen that in some patients, because 
uh, of progressive course of the cause of the dystonia, some patients can, can lose some benefit or can worsen, but usually this is related or to, to the disease pro, um, uh, progression or related to some uh, dysfunction of DBS system. So two categories, one patient who can lose the benefit because there is some problem with the device, Second possibility, one patient who will worsen because, for example, he has a neurodegenerative dystonia where brain abnormalities will progress and where disease symptoms will worsen. So this for the first part of the question. The second one, there is no specific difference related uh, to the maintain or the, uh, the, the length of benefit maintained between the between GPI and subthalamic nucleus DBS in patients with dystonia. However, it is very important to mention that the experience with subthalamic nuclear stimulation in patients with dystonia is much more limited than in patients uh, who received DBS uh, to the GPI. There are really just um, a, a few studies uh, related, uh, reporting subthalamic nu uh, nuclear stimulation for dystonia patients. So one cannot do a really complete answer to this question when comparing the lengths of benefit within, between the two targets. Thank you for this question. Okay, thank you. Um, and Thomas, I have one for you, actually. We looked at the um, different displays that, that people had. Could you possibly talk us through, Thomas, about the display that the patient is able to see in real time every day, just in your experience, what do patients tend to want to see? Indeed. So the, the patient sees much less than the doctor because they don't have a, a big tablet. They just have their, their programmer. And the main displays that they see is, is the device on or off? Uh, which group is on. So there's various groups. For example, you can have a group of settings that include sensing, that includes brain recording, and one that does not. You don't always need to, to be recording. Or you could have a group that helps more with uh, speech versus uh, running, for example. So uh, that's the main uh, things. Is the device on? Which group is on? And then the events. If the events have been set up, then uh, the patient can see what all four types of events that have been set up can be used. So to see if you want the brain signals, you have to ask the doctor when you're in the office to, to see them if you're using that feature because you don't see them live. They don't get uploaded either online. They really stay inside the device. So in that case, it's a, it's a discussion with the, with the doctor. And, and really how much control you have over, for example, uh, changing the stimulation, that can be a possibility, you can sometimes have limits, you can increase or decrease, uh, is really going to depend on a discussion with your doctor, whether that's relevant or, or useful. And then you will see also a little, you know, uh, up and down arrows to, to change some of the settings if that is uh, unlocked in a way. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Dr. Steve, I have a question for you from yes. somebody. It's a, it's, a, it's a therapeutic question, um, which is um, somebody's asking about eligibility for DBS. So they're saying that they have um, cervical dystonia, um, pain on a daily basis, but not a postural problem. They actually have an issue with constant head turning. Um, and would they be eligible for DBS because they don't have a postural problem? So. So, thank you for the question. In, in theory, uh, as discussed a little bit over my presentation, patients with cervical dystonia can benefit from deep brain stimulation, but it's very important to mention and to highlight that the discussion of the indication for patients with cervical dystonia definitely should come after uh, the after the exhaustion or the discussion or the use of other therapeutic means, especially especially botulinum, to botulinum toxin injections, several forms of patterns of cervical dystonia who do not, not respond enough. Um, uh, to, to botulinum toxin can benefit from the brain stimulation. This was repeatedly reported, but 
wants to come before uh, for, with a sufficient length of follow-up, repeated uh, sessions of uh, botulinum toxin injections, the refractoriness of this form of dystonia was not confirmed. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Staying with you, um, we have one as well, which is, is DBS effective in those who've had an anoxic brain injury? Thank you again for, the, for this question. Uh, it's a very, how to say, tricky and large topic. I try to summarize uh, in a way over the presentation by, by reporting a first cohort in adult patients and then a meta-analysis. Um, DBS in patients with post-anoxic brain injury has to be assessed really, really on an individual basis. Why? Because the sequela, the scars, uh, at the level of the brain are very different from a patient to, an, to another. The severity, the location, the clinical presentation uh, in these cases, in these specific uh, cerebral palsy uh, post-anoxic cases are very, very different. A patient can be very mobile with a dyskinetic form, not to have pyramidal tract impairment, but the uh, very mild uh, brain sequela, but there are patients who are much, much more severely impaired with uh, lesions at the le level of the brain. And unfortunately, in these cases, the expectations related to the outcome are more limited. Overall, there are, there are uh, newer, very nice publications from, uh, from the German registry in a po pediatric population, where it was demonstrated very recently to, in 2022, uh, was published, uh, if I don't, if I'm not wrong, um, a, a series of patients with childhood onset post-anoxic dystonia cerebral palsy, and in whom the, the, the outcome, the main outcome was quality of life. And it was documented that in some items, it was some benefit, but if they could not document a very significant, a significant improvement in the motor scores. To make, so to make my answer short, yes, there are trials. Yes, there are patients who benefited, but the selection is really, really patient-based, is an individual selection of the patient based on the uh, brain sequela related to, this, to, related to this injury and also related to the symptoms and their severity. And we have questions pouring in. Um, again, a therapeutic one. How long is the surgery? How long does it tend to be? And is the patient awake or anesthetized during it? So it's it's uh, really different, and the variability of the different surgical procedures is even more important uh, nowadays than some years ago. Why? Because it was usually there were two patterns or two major uh, surgery protocols. One where the, the surgery is uh, made and the, the target is selected only based on imaging for dystonia. And uh, in this case, the, the surgery, the, 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 the length of the surgery is not prolonged related to recordings of the target. And the, the second option where uh, uh, local anesthesia, but is more rare in, rare in patients with, generali with generalized dystonia because this, these patients of course move very much. Uh, so this recording of the target during the surgery will prolong the intervention. For example, for general patients who are operated under generalized anesthesia, around uh, one hour has to be um, uh, considered for the implantation of one lead. Meanwhile, in patients uh, who, uh, in whom recordings of the target are performed, it will depend on the number of the trajectories one or two recordings. So the surgeon will, uh, with the, the neurophysiology team, will record the sound of the target to validate the fact that the lead is in the, in the, the chosen nucleus. So between one hour and more, according to the number of trajectories within the, within the target during the recording. 
and <laughs> and this excuse me and this of course related only to the to the lead implantation because thereafter is the connection with the cable extensions and the neurostimulator which is the second part of the surgical intervention Okay, thank you. Um, and with two minutes to go, I'm going to put one more question to you and then I'm going to hand it back to Edwige. We have more questions pouring in, so we'll take those um, and Edwige will work with Dystonia Europe to get those back to our experts. Um, and Dr. Sif, the final question is, if somebody had DBS in 2006, yes. if they had that, um, can they now have the benefits of the newest technology? Yes. Just once again, so if I, I just want to reformulate to be sure that I understood, because sometimes I didn't hear the full word. Okay. So the question okay. was, the question was whether somebody who received DBS in 2006 could benefit, okay. we think, that uh, um, for the final or the... the the steady state or the the the, the amount of improvement could uh, improved by the new technology this is the question correct could they receive and improve with the new technology so yeah. this is this is a very difficult one definitely a de very difficult one given the fact that uh, one should know which is the steady state for a given patient okay for the given patient and second uh, what is this uh, out? What is this outcome when compared, let's say, to the expected or ideal outcome for a given disease? We will not expect, for example, in a, in a DYT1 disease, the same outcome as, for example, in cerebral palsy. We mentioned that there is really big difference in the amount of the clinical benefit. Did di do uh, directionality can improve somehow? Uh, the clinical benefit, for example, if in case of the patient's the treatment was limited following the 2006 surgery uh, because of side effects. So, for example, the clinician could not um, uh, increase the stimulation because it, he had side effects. So the symptoms partially, in part, was not fully controlled because of the side effects. Maybe in this case, directionality can could bring something, but it's impossible to to make a definite response. Yes, new technology, directionality, and even further sensing is an ad completely other topic. What we can use is directionality for for the instance for uh, for dystonia patients could bring something maybe potentially in the level in the level of the size of the side effects and in this way by orienting the field maybe to complete somehow the benefit but this cannot be uh, let's say uh, said with certainty thank you dr sif and thomas um, I have one more question before we conclude. We do have loads of others, but one more question. Um, and I'm just trying to make sure that I understand the question. So if the if um, the person who's posed that question, if they just write in the chat, if I haven't actually asked it properly, um, but this is for Thomas. How are the Medtronic noise measured for two months? So the, the yeah the, the, I guess the, the how is the is electrical it's a it's a difference in potential between two contacts, so you're really saying there's more electricity in one area versus the other. So that's how the device can tell that there is more activity in location or another. And the reason for the two month is just basically the uh, there's a size of a hard drive inside the, the device that is recording this. These signals are digitized and stored like a you know like a hard drive in your computer. So you cannot just you know keep streaming all or, or saving all the time. You have to to limit the size so you can then download it to the the doctor. So two month is the right balance between we think useful information and also not too much draining of the battery because you don't want to trigger uh, too much draining of the battery by recording the the device and maybe just a, a quick comment that indeed uh you were mentioning earlier about the sports uh it really depends on the patient yan has, has an amazing performance here but not everybody responds in the similar way uh if you're doing contact sports you have to be very careful about the device so it's really 
results may really vary by patient to patient. So I don't think everybody will, I don't, I cannot race hundred kilometers on a bike. So, <laughs> you know, we have to be careful about that. So the, the device is there to help, but it, the responses will vary. I just wanted to, to mention that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Um, actually, I have one question for you, and it might be a bit left field, but um, obviously you're looking at uh, biomarkers as well. Is there, a, is there a possibility of looking at prodromes? So when you're actually looking at these traces, can you actually use it as almost predictive technology as well? So not yet. Uh, we have to be like, like Dr. Sif said, you know, this is too early to say exactly, you know, what will be the, the benefit of sensing. So what we can do is track, we can listen, but we're not there at the, at the future prediction level. So we're, 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 we're saving the data, people that want to share the data. We have research ongoing, but it's too early to tell whether this is actually predictive of, of evolution of disease. Okay. And do you think that will be in the future? It's really going to depend on the disorder because like, like Dr. Steve said, if it's a neurodegenerative and it progresses, then there, there's a case for that, for evolution over time. But if you have a more stable type of disease, then I'm not sure that's going to make a, a big difference. It's really going to depend on the patient and on the, the type of, uh, of disorder is. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, and Dr. Steve, I'm sorry, one more question. No, <laughs> we are here for that. <laughs> to both of you, I think. Is, is there any evidence? of um, changes in um, psychological or cognitive changes post DBS in patients? It was, um, thank you again for the question, it has been reported sporadically that some, uh, some um, effective or uh, symptoms or mood changes could be uh, could be uh, recorded or observed. And uh, later on, during, let's say, the ident identification of, of more specific population groups, it turned out that some of these initial, uh, uh, let's say, um, anxiety or eventually mood alterations uh, under the brain stimulation were more specific in some patients' group, as for example, in myoclonus dystonia patients, where it seems that uh, some psychiatric comorbidity is more frequently associated and not necessarily triggered by the treatment. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and Thomas, I realise that was more of a clinical question. I don't know if you have a comment on that at all from your research. No, really, the, the I mean, in that case, we defer to the physicians for assessing this. I think it's also important why there's this multidisciplinary approach so that it's not just that you're going to get a movement disorder treated, you're going to see a psychiatrist, you're going to see a surgeon, you're going to see potentially a neuropsychologist that could test about your, your impulses or your counting ability, all these uh, spatial thinking, these types of all tests so that we know before the procedure, is it safe to, for you to do as an individual? And then if anything bad happens, we know we can measure what happens. So it's really, uh, you see a lot of doctors that have different specialties to, to exactly assess that. And then there are also just um, uh, instructions for using actual booklets that describe all the potential risks whether they're surgical, like potential bleedings, or whether they're psychological. So we have a list of things, just like you know, any treatment, there's a list of things you should be aware of before that you should read. Uh, but really, that's why you see multiple types of doctors, just to make sure everything is covered at, uh, at baseline before, before implantation, yeah. I Just one comment, I fully agree uh, with, with the comment of uh, Toma. And this was the reason why I finished my presentation on the fact that this treatment uh, has to be uh, provided in an in a appropriate environment with many contributors in the clinical side and also caregivers. It's very, very important. So this is why was the last idea of the, of the presentation. Many, many people, uh, in the medical side has to follow and take care of the patient. It's never simple and it's important. Uh, this is really, really major in, in, the, in the achievement of an improvement and the safety of this lasting treatment because it's a, lo a life lifelong lasting treatment. Thank you. And with that, that multidisciplinary team theme, thank you both for your presentations this afternoon. I've learned a ton. I've thoroughly enjoyed it personally listening to both of you. We have 
tons of questions um, coming in and, and we will actually go back to those after the event. I'm going to hand back over to Edwige shortly to actually um, take the stage and, and close the meeting. But just before I do, I'm just told to tell the participants when you actually um, close out of this webinar, there is like a really brief poll, just four questions for you to ask, to answer, to give your feedback. So if any participants can do that, it would be much appreciated by the organisers. And with that, again, thank you guys. I've so thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'll hand over to Edwige. Yes, thanks a lot, then. Thanks uh, for the moderation, uh, Rachel. Uh, yes, I have 10 person left battery. Yes, I did it. <laughs> thanks, Dr. C. Thanks, uh, Thomas. Thanks a lot for uh, this webinar. Uh, yes, I think DBS is a very large topic to cover. And uh, don't hesitate, uh, attendees, to, to send questions to our email address that you can find uh, or on our internet website, Estonia Europe. So it's a SEC, uh, like secretary, uh, at distoniaeurope.org. So don't hesitate to uh, send your questions, if any. We will uh, publish some uh, replies to them after the, the webinar or when publishing it. So uh, don't hesitate. And don't hesitate to join your national organizations of patients to um, and we have seen the Medtronic assistance uh, numbers too, so they are ve very useful. Um, uh, just following my experience, I can tell you that uh, we use it for friends, for example, and it's very useful to patients. So thanks for thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot. Uh, the webinar will be published in uh, on YouTube channel afterwards, so uh, we'll be able to watch it again. And uh, hope to see you. Uh, again uh, for a future future webinar thanks a lot and have a nice evening everybody bye-bye from Estonia europe thank you very much thank you very much have a nice evening goodbye bye <laughs>